What's been the response since you signed the mask mandate for the city of Atlanta? By and large, people are very happy about it, especially our healthcare professionals, because what we've heard repeatedly is wearing a mask is one of the best ways uh, that we can slow the spread of COVID. And so it's been well received by businesses as well. And I think it gives an opportunity for everyone to do their part. And that's simply protect yourselves and protect other people around you. And again, I think I'm a great example of that. Um, I've worn a mask and continue to wear a mask when I go out in public. And thankfully people who I came in contact with during the period that I didn't know that I had COVID um, had, have tested negative. And so it's extremely important and it's the most unselfish thing that you can do. And it has been very well received because our hospitals are, are being overrun right now. We're reaching capacity, um, ICU capacity in many of our hospitals. Grady Hospital has seen more COVID patients than they even saw in April. So this is a, a very challenging time for our healthcare professionals and uh, that it's been very well received by them, especially. Governor Kemp said that the mandate was unenforceable. What's your thought on that and what are the plans to enforce it? I disagree with that. We can enforce it in the same way we can enforce any other city ordinance. And it also gives us an opportunity, especially in our airport and other city owned facilities uh, to require that people wear a mask and cities across our state have enacted this ordinance and it appears that the governor is one of the, one of the few elected officials in the state uh, who, who for whatever reason didn't seem to think that mask um, should be mandatory so we're going to continue to do what we need to do on behalf of the people of Atlanta to keep them protected because the reality is that our state opened up too soon and we are paying the price for it. Mayor, heading into this weekend, what are the plans and what have the conversations been after the July 4th holiday weekend and the violence? What is the plan moving ahead as we look forward to a new weekend here? The July 4th weekend was like, nothing we've ever seen in our city in recent memory and it was very disturbing and especially tragic for people in our community who lost their lives like uh beautiful Seco uh, little sicoria um and so many others and so we are making sure that we have our officers out and visible also asking people to please avoid large gatherings, one for, for COVID especially, mm -hmm. uh, but secondly, we are seeing a number of the shootings happening where people are gathered in large groups. And what's very different about this crime spree that we're seeing in our city, we are seeing multiple shooters, which is pretty extraordinary. So we're just asking people to um, be aware of your surroundings. And if a situation or an area feels volatile to please remove yourself. And we're gonna continue to do what we need to do with our officers and making sure that they are patrolling areas throughout the city. Uh, but this is, this is a very challenging time, not just in Atlanta, but across the country right now. We talked about a month ago when you set up a task force to reimagine the police. Has the task force met and what's the progress there? The task force has completed the first phase of its work, making recommendations on immediate changes we can make with our policies. So we have already done, uh, enacted many of those changes. The next phase is the community engagement phase so we can receive feedback from people across Atlanta on, on their thoughts and ideas about transformation of our police department. So we are entering that phase now. Uh, we had set a timeline of 45 days for final recommendations. So we are on schedule for that, but this is it's gonna take a while. This is not gonna be an overnight process. We've done what we can do immediately, but there's still more long-term work that needs to be done. And we're also working with many experts, national experts on police reform. The unfortunate part 
with where we are in this country right now, normally you'd be able to go to the Justice Department for guidance and assistance. And uh, I, I, we won't be using this Justice Department for guidance and assistance. We're having to go um, pursue other areas and other experts for that assistance. But that being said, we're still moving along. The community engagement piece you talked about, is that so key for two parts? One, to address low morale within the police department, but also to build that connection and trust between the public and police. Absolutely. In, in meeting with some student activists, I love what one of them said during our, our first meeting. Uh, he said, this can't be a us versus them conversation. It has to be a we conversation. And that we means that we will get input from the public. That input's going to be important, but also getting input from our public safety personnel and our police officers on, on their thoughts of where perhaps their training needs to be clarified and how they can be better partners within our communities. Part of the 21st century policing plan from the Obama Biden administration is very clear. Our officers should be guardians and not warriors within our communities. And so we have a blueprint. We just have to make sure that we're doing all that we can to follow uh, that roadmap that um, is, is very clear about how we should expect policing to happen in our communities. Are there any specific plans for the area around the, the Wendy's, that Sweet Auburn area this, this weekend? Is that going to be a point of focus for the police? It certainly will continue to be a point of focus uh, for our police officers. We, um, and, and even before the last weekend shootings, I had been through there the week before. It was pretty quiet. It was around 9, 9.30 at night. And so there were ups and downs in terms of the activity in that area. And when I went through, I saw three police cars in the area. And so we're going to continue to make sure that we have our officers in the area. And uh, it's just my hope that if people are really want things to settle down, uh, that they will take their energy and take this opportunity uh, to use it in a different way rather than gathering in that area because it's very volatile and still very challenging for us. What steps do you feel like are most critical to bring people together to both address um, racism and social injustice to find the common ground because there's so many factors, whether it's poverty, it's transportation, it's gentrification, it's education. There are so many tenants to it. Um, but it is such a critical juncture we have to, to reach together. We have to hear each other and we have to be patient with each other. And I think it's important that we address those things that we can address, those glaring inequalities that we can address immediately, but also understand that this is a systemic issue that's been a part of our country for over 400 years. And so it's not going to be erased overnight. But in the same way there was a transformation during the civil rights movement, I trust and believe we can have that same transformation in our country today and we will have that same transformation, but we have to be patient and we have to hear each other and we have to see each other. So when people say that they don't see color and they don't see race, quite often people don't understand that therein lies the problem. We are different. We were created differently. It doesn't mean that we are not equal, but it means that there are differences amongst us that we have to acknowledge and we have to respect. And part of our work will be to have a citywide conversation on race. I had the great experience of being a part of Leadership Atlanta. We had a facilitated conversation that was absolutely remarkable and transformative for so many people. And I think that is the type of transformation we need to have across our city. Hmm. I know as moms, we will think about what will this world look like for our kids in five, 10, 20 years and for our grandchildren. It's, it's a very challenging time for our kids. For me, watching the conversations with my kids is, really has been eye-opening. When I received this awful text message and, and my 12 year old received it as well, I heard my 18 year old tell him to get used to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to being a black boy in America. I've been called the N word more times than I can count. 
I had no idea that had happened to my son. And the fact that he in some way thought that that is just something you should come to expect is alarming. And so if it's happening in our city with all of the diversity and awareness that we have in our city, if it's happening with our children and they've come to expect that that is something that, that has been normalized, then it really speaks to the work that we, the enormous amount of work that we have to continue to do in our city. President Trump has announced he will be in our city in short order. I think that it's a part of his typical playbook. Uh, he wants to come and inflame with his rhetoric uh, an already tense and challenging situation that we have in this city. But we'll, we'll, we'll get past it in the same way we'll get past his term as president. We'll get past it. How's everybody in your house feeling? So I just have normal allergy symptoms. I was very tired on yesterday and took a nap, which I, I don't ever do. I don't know if that's COVID or, or just my job. Um, my husband is catching the most of it. He has lost about 20 pounds since last Friday. Uh, he's still sleeping a lot. He's now having night sweats. So a lot of the symptoms that you hear about um, with COVID, but all that being said, his oxygen levels are good. And uh, he, he just literally is sleeping nonstop. My child is asymptomatic, no problems. Good. Um, with our situation, we had taken a COVID test on June 29th. I had taken one after attending the funeral for Rayshard Brooks, just simply because I'd said I would just start getting tested regularly. And so when I got tested, I just decided just to go ahead and have my entire family tested. Nobody was sick, no symptoms. And towards um, the weekend, the following weekend, I just noticed that my husband was sleeping more than usual. And so when I hadn't gotten our results back, I decided to have us all tested again on this past Monday. And we got those results back the same day. My husband, myself, and one of our, our kids was positive. On Tuesday, we got the results back from June 30th. And at that time, I had a child who was positive. So had we gotten those results back sooner, then we would have taken precautions and, and would have uh, immediately begun quarantine and all the things that we tell people to do. And that's the frustrating part about where we are with this lagging in testing. We're encouraging people to get tested, but then if you don't get the results, you can continue to expose um, yourself and others to this virus unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. In terms of COVID response on that federal level or even statewide, do you feel when you're talking to other mayors, is it really uh, having to just fend for yourself at a city level or do you feel a still a partnership within the state ranks and federally at all? I wish our partnership were better and cities aren't charged with administering tests and making sure that testing comes back quickly. That's the state's responsibility. The state um, operates a statewide health department. That's the responsibility of counties throughout the state. But I, to the extent that we are telling people to go and get tested, and to the extent that the governor says testing is readily and easily available, if it takes eight days to get testing in the way that it took eight days for my family to receive the results, then it really is a waste of time. Again, my family is a great example. When we were tested, had we gotten those results back, we would have known that there was someone in our household who was asymptomatic. We didn't get those results back. And it was not until almost a week later, we were tested again. And by that time, three of us had tested positive. That's the reason we can't get on the other side of COVID. It's, that's the reason our ICU beds are at capacity. If we want people to get tested, then we have to get their results back to them quickly so that they can change their, their patterns, so that they can contact people who they've been uh, uh, in, in close contact with and stop the spread of this virus. 
as we're trying so hard to get on the other side or contain COVID-19, there's so many other critical things happening around us, the census being one of them. How has the census response been and what still needs to happen? It's been a challenge for us because we have not been sending people door to door in the way that we had hoped to be able to do so because of COVID-19. So we're still encouraging people, please go online and fill out your census. And if you don't have access to technology that allows you to go online and do it, there's a 1-800 number that you can call. And it's so important. It's the way that we get money into our communities to fix our roads. People complain a lot about the roads in Atlanta. It's the way we get money to help our hospitals, to help with education, so many services, and also the way that we get the representation that we need and deserve locally and in Washington, D.C. Mayor, I always appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Always good to see you.